So, good day everybody, my name is Peter and I work for Cake Solutions. We are a consultancy company focusing on building reactive and data processing applications using technologies such as Scala, Arca, Spark and many others. I had the pleasure to work with a number of companies and quite often I have been asked to tackle problems they faced. And some of these problems were quite repetitive. So I picked a couple of them and made a talk about it. So I'm going to talk about um, problems like um, actors versus futures, serialization, grateful shutdown, distributed transactions, and long tail latencies. After that, I've got a section with um, quick tips, which are basically topics I like to mention, but I don't have uh, time for it. Um, hope everyone will find something interesting. So, let me on. Constraints Liberate, Liberty's Constraint is the name of an excellent talk by Runa Bjarnason. He gave like a year ago at Skyward Conference. Apart from many things, he talks about how constraints liberate us and how we should use the least powerful and the most precise abstraction which does the job for us. And this makes perfect sense in the context of actors versus futures. So this is how our toolbox looks like. On one side we have a future, and on the other side we have Aka actors. Future is a strongly typed local abstraction used for concurrency. It returns just one value by its definition. On the contrary, actors are very dynamic. Um, they are not usefully typed. They receive method as a partial function from NA to unit. So basically, give me whatever and I maybe do some side effect. On the other hand, they are location transparent and they have nice resiliency mechanisms like watching, uh, recovery, supervision, and so on. Uh, apart from that, we have Akatype, which tries to tackle shortcomings of the vanilla actors. Uh, but right now, it is still very experimental and definitely not an option for production usage. And that, by the way, don't confuse this with typed actors, which were deprecated some time ago. Nice middle grounds are ACA streams, which are a static way how to define processing. They are well typed and they also offer back pressure. So as you can see, ACA gives us a couple of options. Some of them are less powerful, constrained and easy to use. And some of them are very powerful and with fewer constraints. But as I said in the beginning, we should try to use the least powerful abstraction which did the job. And now let's take a look at common actor use cases. First one is the state management, which is a very good reason to use actors. Other good reasons why you would like to use them are another ACA core features like um, location transparency or, or resilience. Actors are also by nature great if you want to take advantage of single writer principle. And they can be used as an in-memory log-free cache as well. Another very common usage of actors is sharding. And futures should be used in cases when we need just local concurrency. Surely this is achievable by actors easily, but futures are much easier to use. Futures require far less writing and we can take advantage of functional approach so we can enjoy type safety or future composition and all these things we love. So do not overuse actors. As you probably know, Java serialization is very slow, footprint heavy as has Scala version binary compatibility issues. And as you may know as well, Java serialization is the default in Akka and that's pretty bad for us. There are two main reasons why we want to serialize data when using ACA. First one is sending data through the network. So, so we have an actor which serializes a message and sends it to another actor. The second actor decides the message, creates a response and sends it back. This round trip is often called ping pong test and is often used for for evaluation of serialization libraries. 
The second example is persisting data into local storage. Therefore, serialization is very important when working with ACA persistence, for example. So let's have a quick, uh, quick look at this graph. It compares trips, round, round, round trips of various serialization libraries. I'm pretty sure it is very hard to read, but uh, so I added the arrow, which, allows that, which shows us where the Java implementation stands. And this graph shows us the footprint size. As you can see, the last plot. By the way, if you like to see sources of this, they are in the references slide in the end. Here we can see how ser serialized data looks like for a very simple class. The footprint of generalization is far bigger than the footprint of not very efficient format like XML or JSON. The reason for that is it doesn't serialize just, just data, but it also serializes the entire class definition and all definition of all reference classes. So it was generalization, but before we move on, let's quickly summarize what points we should have in mind when choosing between various libraries, like aforementioned performance or footprint size, and also many others like schema evolution support, human readability, language bindings, and so on. Uh, just a quick note, as we are in Scala by the Bay, all libraries I'm going to mention or I'm going to talk about have Scala APIs. JSON is the most used human readable format these days, surely, there are some others like XML or CSV or whatever. We certainly have their use cases, uh, but I would go mainstream. Surely it has disadvantages. It's relatively slow and bloating. But if you need a human readable format, it's, it's a good way to go. And the good thing is there is uh, so many great libraries available. For binary formats, we have two options. Firstly, schemaless formats, meaning data are sent together with corresponding metadata. The main advantage is we don't have to define schema, so it is almost like using Java serialization. But performance-wise, it is a very different story. As an example, we can have Cryo and its Scala library named Chill. And by the way, setting up this in Akka is a matter of minutes. And now let's take a look at binary formats with schema defined by some kind of DSL. So they offer great performance and minimal footprint. And they usually provide built-in support for schema evolution. Popular choice is protobuf and a couple of related projects like um, Fedbuffers and Captain Proto. Great alternatives are Thrift and Avro. For summary, I like to say you should always, or if you plan to go to production at least, replace Java serialization with something else. This very depends on your particular use case, so I leave it up to you. But if you want to have some quick blind recommendation, I would go for one of these JSON4S, Cryo, and Protobuf. All of them are great and proven libraries, and they should work to your satisfaction. Uh, another topic I like to discuss is graceful shutdown. So let's say we have thousands of sharded actors on tens of nodes, and we want to shut one of them down because of maintenance or hardware issues or whatever. Essentially, we want to do something like this, but we don't want to lose data which are already in the node. This operation must be totally transparent to our users. So. Let's talk about how the procedure should look like from a high-level point of view. Uh, I really wanted to show you some code samples here, but I was unable to squeeze it here. But if anyone is interested, they are in the, in the backup section in the end. Firstly, JVM gets the shutdown signal, which triggers this whole exercise. When this happens, we tell coordinator the procedure has started. Coordinator is a stateful entity which manages various states of graceful shutdown. As I like Akka, in my case, coordinator would be implemented as an FSN actor, but of course you can do it differently. Now coordinator has to tell local shard regions they have to leave the cluster and wait until it's done. 
So it has to send a CAS graceful shadow message and watch their lifecycle updates. When it is done, the coordinator asks the node to leave the cluster and gives singletons a grace period to migrate. Unfortunately, there is no callback for this, so it has to wait a specified amount of time. Finally, we can kill coordinator, shut, uh, shut down the actor system, and let JVM to be terminated. At some point, you will have to add messages for interaction with, with your sharded actors. Uh, just a quick note, if you want to stop actor gracefully, use passivate. If you need to stop it immediately, use context.stop. And the last thing I want to mention is the priority mailbox. It's good to have it because it allows your graceful shutdown slash common messages to be handled in priority. But, uh, basically, it maintains two queues, one for normal and one for priority messages. And it, also, it may also respond with something like the node is shutting down so the message can be resent to another node. So let's have a quick summary. We usually don't want to lose data. Sometimes it's fine. But most of the time, we do care about it. The implementation itself is not that hard, but some knowledge is necessary. We need to implement a node shutdown coordinator to handle various states of the shutdown procedure. And this guy needs to be instantiated in on every sharded node. And finally, we, we have to do some integration with our sharded actors. So, so that's it for Graceful Shutdown. And now let's move on and take a look at the distributed transactions. So distributed transactions, or any situation where a single result, so in single event results in the changes of two or more separate data sources, which cannot be committed atomically. Of course, this definition is very informal, but I think it suits our purpose well. The problem is, especially for naive implementations, it works most of the time. But there is something named seven fallacies of distributed computing. In case if anyone has not heard about it yet, uh, please take a look at it, it's very crucial. You know, if this would be the only thing you got from this talk, it was totally worth it. So just a quick insight. We are, to we are talking about a set of false assumptions people tend to make about distributed systems, like the network is reliable, latency is zero, bandwidth is infinite, and so, so on. And this, this makes distributed transactions quite challenging. A classic approach how to tackle distributed transactions is, is the two-phase commit. The point of 2PC is it performs tentative operations first, and if all succeeds, the commits are confirmed. So basically, it prepares the operation, which is valid for a certain amount of time or until acknowledged. And this is definitely possible to implement in, in a reactive way using asynchronous messages. But of course, we need to have at least one delivery guarantee, and therefore, we need to have some kind of persistent storage. And also, we have to take care of the duplication, and we have to, or we have to use idempotent messages. But the main problems are, it does not scale well, it's slow, and has certain deadlock issues. As I said, it was possible to implement this in Akka, but there is a, there is a better way. And there's the Saga pattern. Uh, Saga is a real world solution how to tackle distributed transactions. The point of Saga is that each of the local commits also contains a counterpart. The counterpart is compensating action of the corresponding transaction. So the textbook example is that we have commits or sub-transactions, if you will, like book a hotel, rent a car, or buy a ticket with compensating actions like cancel the hotel or the car or whatever. And if something goes wrong, we apply all compensating transactions and reverse the transaction. Again, we have to take care of requirements like at least once delivery, the duplication, and so on. But this is the way you should go. But there is an alternative option. 
try to avoid distributed transactions where possible, meaning that every business event needs to result in a single synchronous commit and the other data sources could be updated asynchronously. So basically we are going to give up uh, all or nothing approach and we are going to introduce eventual consistency in our system. And this is often the best thing you can do. So the outcome of this section should be distributed transactions are hard, expensive, fragile and do not scale well and should be avoided where possible. If you cannot avoid them, go for the Saga pattern based implementation. And now it's time to take a look at long tail latencies. So consider a system where each service typically responds in 10 milliseconds but with a 99th percentile of one second. The distribution could look like this. The latencies we would expect are green, long tails are orange. So the 99th percentile could be like 30 times slower and in case of 99th percentile it could be like 50 times slower. And th this graph by the way also shows us how important it is to study whole latency distributions, not just means. Using means only the problem could be overlooked easily. The 99th percentile of 30 millis means that one request in 100 experiences 30 millis latency instead of expected, let's say, one millisecond. Moreover, most of our systems are distributed microservices, so one request can create a bunch of other requests in our system. For example, let's say one client request generates 10 sub-requests and assume there is a 1% probability to hit a slow service. So we got 9.5% chance the request is affected by the slow response. Long tails can be caused by various reasons like hardware or network issues, misconfigurations, architecture or implementation problems and so on. Uh, but it's important to realize it's not just a noise or some, or some peaks or whatever, it's a real problem. Usually, when the first thing we do when we are facing a problem is try to sort it out. We try to narrow it, isolate it, and tackle it, and so on. We all know this. But this is usually not that easy. Actually, tackling these kind of issues in a distributed environment is very hard. But I don't want to talk about it today. I want to talk about tolerating long tails in, in a similar way how we tolerate failures. There's a bunch of various approaches, so let's have a very quick look. Hedging requests, meaning sending the same request to multiple servers and, se uh, and use whatever comes back first. Just a very important note, to avoid doubling or tripling your load, do not send the hedging request immediately, but try to wait until the original request is, has been outstanding for more than like 95th percentile. So additional load should be around 5%, but long tails should be shortened significantly. Then we have tight request. It means instead of de delaying before sending out hedge request, we enqueue requests simultaneously on multiple servers. And, but we, and we tie them together with the information about the others. When the first server processes the request, it can tell the others to cancel it from their queues. In a real Google system, this reduced median latency by 16% and the 99.9 percentile was reduced by 40%. Selectively increase replication factors. This one is pretty obvious. Try to have more copies of things which you find more important. We can also try to temporarily exclude the slow machine from our operations. Since the problems might be temporary, we can continue send shadow requests to the machine and monitor it. If the problem disappears, we can put it back. Consider good enough responses, meaning responding with incomplete results in exchange for better end-to-end -end latency. And also the last one, hardware, hardware updates can be the fastest and reasonably cheap way to tackle the problem. So consider this as well. So there was the last topic I want to talk about, but before I finish, I got um, just a couple of points I'd like to mention at least, aka I haven't enough time topics. The first, uh, first one is monitoring. Monitoring is very important. Try to implement it as soon as possible, not when performance tests two weeks before production goes wrong. 
Secondly, network partitions are real and surprisingly common. And also, split blame resolver is a must when implementing distributed system. It is very funny when you don't have it and you face split brain scenario with persistent actors or cluster singletons on board. Blocking, this one is quite tedious. Try to avoid blocking where possible. If you need to block, use dedicated dispatcher or thread pool for that. Uh, most of the time, a single actor by JVM is all you need. Aka provides nice bulk handling features, so use them instead. For error handling, try to take advantage of supervision. And now it's time for a question, but I'm afraid I'm a little bit late, so if you have any, try to find me. Yeah, no, sorry, we don't have time for questions. These 20 minute sessions are tough on the presenters, so uh, good job getting through all the content there. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah.